Tonight's speaker, Thomas Levinson, is the director of the graduate program in science writing at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he is also a professor in the Department of Writing and Humanistic Studies. He recent, recently published the book, Newton and the Counterfeiter, The Unknown Detective Career of the World's Greatest Scientist, which you will have seen in the lobby and which is the subject of tonight's lecture. He's also the author of Einstein in Berlin, Measure for Measure, A Musical History of Science, and Ice Time, Climate, Science, and Life on Earth. His television documentaries include Origins, Back to the Beginning, Building Big Domes, and Einstein Revealed for Nova and PBS. He's earned a Peabody Award, a New York Chapter Emmy, and the AAAS Westinghouse Awards. His articles and reviews have appeared in the Atlantic Monthly, Boston Globe, and Discover Magazine. And he's for he's the winner of a National Academy's Communication Award for his work as producer of Nova's Origins. And he that award recognizes excellence in reporting and communicating science to the general public, and that's a talent for which we'll be um, getting a taste this evening. I'm very pleased to introduce Tom Levinson. Thank you, Maggie, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, Joanne and the National Academies for this wonderful series. And the, let me reiterate also thanks to the MBL. It's, it's a delight to be speaking in this venue and in this, uh, in this, I don't have to tell anyone here what an extraordinary institution this is. Um, and I thank you all for coming out on a Monday night to talk some Isaac Newton. Um, to get right down to it, um, I found when I started work on this project, something that seemed like a curiosity and actually is something I think, and I hope to persuade you in the course of the next few minutes, uh, is a way into a much deeper insight not just about Isaac Newton and, and, and interesting facets of his life, but about the way the scientific revolution happened, the way, you know, and what its significance was, and I think by reasonable extrapolation, still is, as not just a, uh, a series of incidents in the history of thought, but as something that is uh, penetrating everyday life in often very unexpected ways. So, to begin, let me just suggest to you that well, we all know who, we, who Isaac Newton was, or at least we think we do. We remember him as perhaps the greatest mathematician of all time, certainly the greatest physicist, most, at least the most significant in history. Uh, and he was certainly also, I think everybody understands, uh, one of the creators and chief evangelists for um, this approach to the understanding of nature uh, that we now call modern science. Um, some people in this room probably know, I'm sure of it in fact, given this audience, uh, of Newton's fascination with religious history and theology. He was a heretic, but he was a deeply committed religious thinker. Uh, you probably know about him as a secret alchemist, uh, and at the very least, as the owner of a significant uh, apple tree. <laughs> but almost no one recalls yet one more career, and yet they should. He was one of the first true civil servants. Finan you know, he was a financial bureaucrat in the service of the uh, English and then British government. Uh, and in that context, he was a criminal investigator, a detective, a cop. And one of the reasons I say that people should know about it if they've got any interest in Isaac Newton is just consider this. Isaac Newton went to Cambridge as an undergraduate, aged then, I think, 19, uh, in 1661. He stayed there until 1696. That's 35 years. He was at the rent, first as warden and then as master, from 1696 to 1727, 31 years, almost the same amount of time. And if you sort of discount undergraduate years, perhaps as still the formation of a character, just about equivalent, almost, almost exactly equal in years in terms of his adult life was spent at Cambridge as a professor and in London as a civil servant and at least some of the time as a cop. Um, so tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about the most dramatic and important case that he pursued during his years investigating bad behavior in the city of London. Um, but what I'm really going to try and pull out of different strands of that story is some insight into how Newton thought and worked 
and I'm going to try and make the case to you that how we thought and worked in this instance illuminates much else besides. Um, and that much else, ultimately, is an understanding from a somewhat different perspective of how Newton and his fellow scientific revolutionaries uh, created the world that we live in today. So to begin, the first question I get asked is, how did I find this story in the first place? I mean, everybody, you know, Newton chasing a bad guy, a really bad guy, a very uh, expert bad guy around London for two years. It took Newton a long time to crack this case. How on earth did I uncover this? Well, you know, chance, good luck. I was working on a project completely different from this. It was the, actually the musical history of science that Maggie referenced. Um, and of course, if you start, if you try to tell the history of science, and you start with the Greeks, and you go to the, the present, at some point in that timeline, you intersect Newton. And so I was doing some reading about Newton in an old biography. I came across a quote from a letter and it, from, from, that had been stored in Newton's files. Here's how it went, just part of it. Oh, my offending you has brought this upon me. Dear sir, do this merciful deed. Oh, for God's sake, if not for mine, keep me from being murdered. A little further down the letter. Oh, dear sir, nobody can save me but you. Oh, God, my God, I shall be murdered unless you save me. Oh, I hope God will move your heart with mercy and pity to do this thing for me. I am your near-murdered humble servant, <laughs> William Challoner. Now, that's pitiful. I mean, that's a, that, I mean, it's marvelous. It's a human voice in desperation speaking across three centuries. And, uh, you know, any human being would have, even no matter how bad the guy was, and I didn't know at the time, but he was pretty bad, but no matter how awful he was, you, you have some sympathy for a person, you know, facing the imminent threat of the gallows. Uh, except I'm a writer, and my first thought was not, oh, poor fellow, but what on earth was this guy doing in correspondence with Isaac Newton? There is a story here. I must go get it. It took me, actually, more than a decade. Uh, there were other things going on. I was pulling other strands. But mostly it was hard to find enough material that actually could give you not just the impression of a story, but the real substance of an argument that I could hope to make to audiences like this one with, with you know, that demand a certain kind of rigor and authenticity. Uh, and my good luck came when I finally tracked down a trove of documents that are now in the public records office in Kew uh, uh, in, in southeastern, southwestern London. Um, it's the only remaining folder of Newton's criminal investigations in the year 1696 to 1700. Uh, Newton's nephew-in-law, who succeeded him as master of the mint, reported helping Newton burn some of his files, which is itself interesting, because Newton was something of a graphomane, and there are enormous numbers of his papers in existence. And there's no real record of him burning any of them except these. So who knows what was in them and why Newton felt compelled to destroy them. But fortunately for me, and hopefully for you if you like this sort of story, um, the documents that survived that were in this one old folio, about 400 of them, cover all the, the surviving summaries, depositions, interrogatories, uh, some really minor bureaucratic details like you know notes moving prisoners from one, one holding place to another. Uh, but crucially, all the ones that were on this case covered exactly the period. So that was when I not only knew there was a good story here, there was enough material to actually try and tell it. So that's how I got started. But what was really interesting was what happened when, when I got the chance to dive into these documents. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more later, later on about Newton's methods as a detective, because they're really they're, they're evocative of things you probably know much more about Newton's work. Um, but what was there was this record, piece by piece, as Newton talks to this person and that person and turns one informer and gets another informer, of not just the specific case, but all, ki all the kinds of ways that people tried to make it through the day, not necessarily by legal means, but you know, tried to get things done in late 17th century London as, among other things, the scientific revolution was happening all around them. And that was when I knew I had not just a story, but actually an important one, one that had sort of thematic richness, because this, for me, seemed to give me a chance to tell the story of the scientific revolution as it was experienced by the people at the time at street level. You know, we have this image, I think, and it's promulgated in, in, in particularly the sort of sorts of presentations that you know, most of the public gets, uh, which is this vision of the scientific revolution as this sort of series of events led by great generals, great commanders. You know, if it's a revolution, there must be commanders, right? You've got Copernicus, and you've got Kepler, and you've got Galileo, and you've got Descartes, and then, you know, leader of them all, the master of them all, the commander-in-chief, Isaac Newton, triumphantly bringing the revolution uh, to fruition. 
Um, but it wasn't that way. I mean, those people certainly existed. They did great things, but they did them in the context of an enormously richer and more important uh, social, political, economic web of activity. Um, and even that sort of too grand a systematization. They did it within networks of individuals doing things that were relevant to their lives that accumulated into critical discoveries. And I'll talk about one of them just as an example in a moment. So I have this sort of frame. I have this access to Challoner, this access, or at least access to Challoner's case, and I have this story of a confrontation between two men. I'm trying to find out what this tells me about what was actually going on in London at the time. Um, first key was to try and understand Challoner. And there's a lot about Newton, there's a lot out there. There's very little about Challoner. And he was surprisingly one of the most successful antagonists of Newton uh, that Newton ever faced. I mean, you know, Newton dispatched Hook with more ease and, and, and viciousness than he did this, this uh, not terribly well-lettered or educated weaver's, or weaver's son from, uh, from the Midlands. So I wanted to understand who Challoner was and how he got to the point where he was able to do these, these quite remarkable things. And I had tracked down, there's, a, there's very little on him. There's a, a penny dreadful biography that was published within days of his execution. Um, that is, you know, in the book I go into this a little bit more, but it's, as, as a sideline, it tells you something about the changes going on in England, that there is, in fact, a low-cost, cheaply made, cheaply produced, rapidly printed, uh, popular literature in, available in London at that time. There's a dissemination of information. There is a 17th, late 17th century um, sort of blogosphere or internet, as it were, occurring, um, not just in this instance, there, there, you know, there's an enormous sort of wave of print arguing the critical questions of the day, including the one that animated Newton and Challenger, what to do about a bad currency system. Um, and it's going on all the time. And thankfully, it goes on to enough spread and extent that there is one genuinely contemporary attempt at a biography of this otherwise, you know, one of dozens executed for criminal offenses every few months. So there's that record. There's some writing that Challoner himself did. He actually published pamphlets on what to do to save England's economy and its currency system in the mid-1690s. Um, this is kind of like asking John Gotti what to do about Social Security. I mean, there's enormous bravado there. Um, but those are there. And there's, there's a few other records. So putting all that together, um, you can build a kind of, uh, you know, a glimpse of the trajectory uh, of a life attempting to rise in the very rapidly transforming world of early modern, late 17th century England. We know that he was an out-of-control child, or at least his, his uh, biographer tells us that he was too much for his parents to handle, and he was apprenticed at an early age to a nail maker. Again, another sort of harbinger of great changes. Nail makers, nail makers didn't used to exist uh, in, the early 16, in the early 17th century. Um, nail making was just part of, of general blacksmithing, and a blacksmith was, a, was an aristocrat of trade, an aristocrat of craft, one of the most important men in the, in the villages and small towns. Um, but with the invention of what were called slitting mills, it became possible, in essence, to mass produce the rods that you make nails from and turn nail making into a piecework, very poorly paid, underskilled uh, occupation that you could really only make a bare living. You, got, you bought rods and you sold back nails to the person you bought rods from for a very tiny margin. And if you wasted any, if you had any flaws, uh, you would tend to, to starve very quickly. Um, this is not a way for an ambitious, out of control, uh, wealth-loving young man to make his way in the world. So very quickly, Challoner uh, did a quite serious thing. He broke his apprenticeship. He just ran away um, and got to London. He probably walked. And even though he was this, you know, local village boy of, of apparently, you know, great mischief and, and ability, um, London had to have come as a terrible shock. Uh, Challoner was apprenticed in Birmingham. We now know Birmingham is one of the, you know, it's a, it's a name to evoke sort of images of the Industrial Revolution, a great city, the, the dark satanic mills of the poem and all that. Uh, back then, it was a substantial market town of maybe 10,000 people. You know, a biggish place, but nothing, nothing out of the common run. London was unique. London had a population of about 600, just under 600,000 people. It was larger than the next 60 cities and towns in England combined. There was no other place like it in the English-speaking world. It was deadly. It was a horrible place. I mean, you could, you approached it through the stench of the dumped um, human waste that was cleared every day. 
uh, had to be gotten out of the city somehow. Preferably, though, often not. Uh, you know, not using this, uh, the River Thames. Um, the air was terrible. People, you know, it wasn't as bad as the choking fogs, the famous pea supers of the 19th century. Uh, but King William moved his palace uh, from more, a more central location to Kensington and then further out to try and escape the miasma. Newton, at the end of his life, did the same. He moved his house from the place he lived in for most of his time in London to a hopefully more healthy place. Uh, the water was foul. There's a reason that there's a whole long history of uh, English legislation on the taxing and supply of beer and spirits. It's because everybody had to drink something other than water if you didn't want to die of the flux. Um, deaths, you know, this is all, these are all sort of, you know, qualitative statements. The, the data is, and it's been repeated by a bunch of different demographers who looked at different data sets, deaths exceeded births in London until well into the 18th century. You know, um, there's one study of, of Quakers who are known not to have been terrible drunks and were, you know, sober and hardworking and were generally regarded as a model subset of London's population at the time. Three out of five of their kids died before the age of, I can't remember if it was five or seven, remember, but it was, a, you know, three out of five died while they were still children. I mean, it's a terrible place. And yet this population grew and grew quite rapidly throughout the 17th century and well into the 18th century. Immigration from the countryside, thousands upon thousands of people just like Challoner, poor, ambitious, or poor, desperate um, people being dislocated by all kinds of changes in the countryside, coming into London, trying to make a living. Um, and most of them couldn't. I mean, there is a reason that London was famously a home of the sex trade. I'll get into that in just a little bit more in a moment. In the late 17th and early 18th century. And it wasn't just the release of the end of the Puritanic, uh, you know, era during the, um, you know, the fall of the, the Cromwell and the English Civil War, it was the fact there was this enormous supply of people for whom there was no work who had to make a living somehow. Um, you couldn't get into London occupations, legal or illegal, without some kind of web of connections. Everything was organized there. Newton was brought in by friends from Cambridge to become warden of the Mint. Um, people who wished to get involved in trades like the cheese trade or the hatting trade, you know, the, the haberdashery or, or making or hatters, uh, had to make contact with the guilds, get accepted, and so forth and so on. There were four or five guys who controlled all the Cheshire trade for cheddar cheese in London at this time. Uh, as late as the uh, the early uh, like 1730s, I believe, there was a guy who was literally stomped to death for the the crime of daring to make a lady's hat without sanction by the Hatters Guild. Um, you know, you couldn't make a legitimate living unless you had, unless you were wired in some way. And the same was true of crime. Crime was organized, often organized around fences or uh, or tavern or pub owners who were sort of centers of information. But there were, you know, there were very sophisticated systems of crimes. Uh, pickpockets. You all remember Oliver Twist. Uh, I mean, obviously that's a 19th century setting, but that's a that's actually a very close representation of what the the guild or trade or, 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 or practice of, of pickpockets did. You had Nips and Foynes, who were the people who actually um, took the wallet. Nips were less sophisticated than Foynes. They actually sliced a pocket. Foynes were very, you know, they were the gentlemen of the trade. They actually reached in and, uh, and, and took the wallet without any damage to the uh, Mark's clothes. Then there were other people who were designed to jostle the, uh, jostle the Mark. Another person who was to take the wallet. I mean, there was a whole set of of tasks. Shoplifting was done the same way, and people did even more elaborate things. There was a gang led by the marvelously named Obadiah Lemon, who developed the technique of using fishing tackle to hook scarves and hats from ladies passing in carriages at a particular low-lying bridge. You know, they owned that area as well. So you couldn't just be this kid from the countryside walking in saying, "Okay, I'm going to make, I'm going to stick people up. I'm going to, you know, pick." I mean, you couldn't do it. Couldn't break in. Challenger was at a stand, despite the fact that he was this boy with, with, you know ambition and, and a tendency to evil. His biographer then, in a very brief passage, captured, I think, something in the spirit of Challoner really quite beautifully. I'm um, just checking my, how I'm doing with my time here. Okay, got to keep, got to keep rolling, got to keep rolling. Um, here's what he wrote. Having a working brain, it took him only a few months, and the path he found earned him then some scandalized admiration of, of the biography. He had this working brain. The first part of his ingenuity showed itself in making tin watches with dildos in them. These Challoner hawked about the streets and thereby picked up a few loose pence and looser associates. Thank you for that question. I didn't plan it. What, was it? What, what on earth was it? It took me several days to actually track this down. I called first Will Andrews, the former curator of Historical Scientific Instruments at Harvard, who was a 
who was, among other things, the expert behind uh, David Sobel's marvelous book, La uh, Longitude, uh, a great, one of, the, one of, the, one of the, the leading experts on clocks and clock making. And we were very excited. I'd known him from, from before. We were excited because for a moment, we thought we'd actually made a genuine horological discovery. Um, in the 1660s, Robert Hooke, the so-called Leonardo of England, uh, had invented uh, the balance spring mechanism for driving watches in a, in a, with a continuous sustained release of energy. This is the, the particular mechanism that permitted ultimately things like the creation of reliable ocean growing chronographers because you could actually wind them up and they would keep steady time. It was great. Thomas Tompion, the great English instrument maker, who'll make a brief cameo appearance in this talk in just a couple of minutes, uh, produced the first such watch. And, you know, Tompion was, was genuinely one of the real um, uh, sort of unsung stalwarts of the scientific revolution, creating a lot of the apparatus and some of the systems for doing scientific observation. He was, by the way, and, uh, you know, it's only a factoid, but it's a lovely factoid. He was the first craftsman to use serial numbers to number his productions. So in a very small way, bringing the systematization of validating measurements. You know, how do you, how do you know, this is something Newton was very concerned with, how, how do you get good information hygiene? How do you know your measurements are reliable? And one of the ways you do is you keep records on your instruments. Identify their, their, their flaws and faults, and you, you, you have some understanding of what they're actually telling you. Tompion, this craftsman, not a scientist, was the first person to hit on this particular device. Anyway, so they made this balance spring mechanism, and over the next decades, um, these, uh, these balance spring watches became you know, the cutting edge of technology and the finest watches and uh, accoutrements of the rich. You know, just like today, you want the, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm already failing because this is only an iPhone 3. It's not an iPhone 4. But, you know, you want the, the, the most wonderful. Well, it's true in the 18th century, too. Things don't change. Um, and we thought, Will and I, that we had identified an early, the earliest known example, if it had been true, of the use of a balanced spring clockwork mechanism to drive a pornographic automaton. Sadly, some reflection showed that was almost certainly, I mean, it really, it, not almost certainly, it is, it, that ain't true. It wasn't that. There's no way, you know, no conceivable way that Challoner, as this half-taught nailmaker's apprentice, could have, within a few months, uh, mastered skills that people apprenticed at watchmakers for years to get a handle on. Uh, so with Will's help, I tracked down some experts in London, and ultimately it turns out that almost certainly what this was was something called uh, a pewter watch or a tin watch. And what these were is another example of, you know, very little in human nature actually changes. Rich people had balance spring watches that were the emblem, that were both useful because they told good time, and the emblem of wealth and sophistication. Poor people had to still rely on church clocks and so forth to tell good time, um, but wanted the emblems of wealth and sophistication. So what these were were pewter cases that had no clockwork in them, but looked like modern watches. And they often had very nice designs on them. And the presumption is, you know, this is, you know, the argument that was presented to me by people who had the, the wits. Now, only a very few of these tin watches have been found. They've all been found in the tidal margins of the Thames, uh, and they're in the collection of the Museum of London. And the curator there said, almost certainly what this was was some kind of pornographic design engraved on one of these, uh, you know, watch cases, these pewter watch cases that people would have in their pockets. So, I mean, you, you can sort of have this image of Challoner as a sort of French postcard salesman standing on a corner going... Um, and obviously, this is not... You know, the interesting thing to me about the story is, is twofold. One is, it's a cultural expression of the scientific and technological revolution uh, in a very peculiar way. You know, look what he was selling. He was selling um, a racy emblem of modernity. That was what he was able to make his living in. Uh, you know, this is, this is what the culture was giving him, the society was giving him as a way to put a crust of bread in his mouth. Um, and he was very clever. You know, you need networks to survive. He had no network. He uses his rudimentary metalworking skills to come up with these tin watches with dildos in them, thereby picks up a few loose pens and looser associates. This is how he broke into the criminal world. He actually, he was charismatic. He was a very good talker, it became clear. Uh, and this was enormously useful to him. He went on to, to you know, uh, bigger and better things very rapidly. Um, just to digress a moment, what I want to do is just sort of get back to this theme of the scientific revolution coming up in the society in interesting ways. It wasn't just a cultural expression of modernity. People actually took part in the actual making of science itself 
on a level very different from that of the imagined idea of Newton sitting in his chamber, uh, you know, working out mathematics in isolation. He certainly did some of it. He did a lot of that in 1684 to 1687 when he was writing Principia. But even then, at this sort of moment when you can see the image of Isaac Newton as the as the great mind conjuring modern physics out of out of his head, it's actually something that again is embedded in genuine everyday life, not just a network of similarly positioned, not quite as brilliant, brilliant folks, but everyday life. Um, at the very end of that book, The Principia, in the third book, The So-Called System of the World, you know, Newton's taking you through all the derivations to demonstrate the application of the laws of motion and uh, concepts like inertia and the law of gravity and all that. And he finally, in the system of the world, shows how, these, how this apparatus applies to a number of different problems the motions of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn and so forth, and eventually brings it back down to Earth to analyze the problem of the tides. Now, Simon Schaefer, who's a great historian of science at Cambridge, uh, drew my attention to this passage and said, remember, Isaac Newton, who solved the problem of the tides and lived on an island, never saw the ocean. So how did he get his information? How did he do it? How did he get the data he needed in order to perform this extraordinary and important practical calculation at the end of Principia. Well, English sailors, me- this is a brief quote from the book, just to give you a taste of it. English sailors measured tides all over the world, from England to the West Indies and the South China Sea. And traders upholding the power of the crown across the oceans learned mathematics and developed precision tools to measure the motions of stars and planets. Instrument makers began to establish the crucial idea of standards, common measures that would enable observers anywhere to trust one another's results. That's the Thomas Tompion story I was just telling you. This was revolution of the barricades, a headlong charge by its partisans to organize, abstract, and universalize their experience of daily life so that its distilled essence would be accessible to anyone who sought it out. And to really drive this point home, I tell the story of John Locke, who is great political philosopher, theorist of money, um, great voice for uh, for toleration in religious thought. And it turns out, at Robert Hooke, uh, at Hooke and Boyle's uh, suggestion, amateur weather observer. He had his own instruments. He had a barometer, a thermometer, made again by Thomas Tompion, um, and a measurement for when, uh, instrument for measuring wind speed. And he took data every morning when he was a young man, then after a political career that was interrupted by revolution and intrigue and all that, back again as an old man. Uh, that was published immediately after his death in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. Um, you know, and that Locke, who documented the details of precision instruments, he, he wrote down exactly what his instruments were made and where they came from, all the provenance, and checked the amount of rainfall and barometric pressure each day, noting the time of every measurement, was one more cadre in this growing revolutionary band, adding his tiny increment to the arsenal of knowledge. Scientific revolution, I think, is properly understood as you know, obviously this great transformation in ideas, but as a social transformation as well. Social transformation populated by famous people like uh, John Locke and much less famous uh, famous people like a a character who makes a brief appearance in my book, Thomas Taylor, who actually made the dyes with which Chaloner counterfeited French and English coins, but was also somebody who published the first rigorous atlases of England and Wales and even presented to the public as scientific communication for the public, exactly what we're doing tonight, a broadsheet explaining the orbital geometry of the total eclipse of the early 1720s that was visible in England. So, I mean, it was happening, you know, this was, a, you know, Taylor was a guy who sold his publications out of, out of taverns on Fleet Street. This was not, you know, a grand thing. This was, this was a, 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 a broad citizen experience, uh, which is obviously something that I think is very good for a society. Maybe not obviously. But anyway, back to Challenger's earlier career. Uh, he went from a stint as a, as a, as a pornographic salesman uh, to becoming a, a quack doctor and a con man. Um, then he became a recoverer of stolen goods, which was easy to do if you helped arrange the thefts in the first place. Um, this is actually a, a, a well-trodden path to wealth. Uh, I don't know how many of you read David Liss's book, uh, novel, A Conspiracy of Paper. If you haven't, it's really fun. It's a very good read. Uh, but he describes part of the career of Jonathan Wilde, who was a real historical figure about 20 years after the timing of my story, who did exactly the same thing. Uh, and grew very, very wealthy and powerful for a while out of it. Um, It was as a receiver of stolen goods that he got too close to an actual theft, uh, was implicated in one of the crimes and had to lie low to avoid being arrested. And while he was lying low and getting poorer, because it's very expensive uh, 
to the underground in London. Um, he learned how to gild from somebody who actually daubed old clothes black, something called a Japaner after, and after the, uh, the, the trade of lacquering that had just been exported from the Far East. Again, these network webs of interconnection uh, that are present in all kinds of odd ways when you look for them. And from this technique of Japaning, um, Chaloner picked up how to, how to actually skim coat metal, pot metal, with thin skims of silver and gold. And he emerged after about a year out of circulation as one of the most skilled counterfeiters England had ever seen. And that's what brought him into confrontation with this then still fairly obscure Cambridge Don named Isaac Newton. Now it's the next obvious question, which is, you know, how do you get to Isaac Newton in the, you know, how does Isaac Newton get to Cambridge, uh, get from Cambridge to London in the first place? And the um, simplest answer is, you know, it's hard to keep them down on the farm once they've seen Paris, or in this case London. Principia made Newton world famous, or at least at least Europe and North American famous. Um, Newton's good fortune and good sense to pick the right side in the glorious revolution that replaced the last Stuart king with William and Mary uh, also helped. Um, and uh, that directly led to his, tra his translation to London in 1688 and 89, when Newton was elected as a member of parliament for Cambridge to, um, to vote in the convention parliament that legitimized the takeover, the, the theft of the, the to, turn, to turn the theft of the crown into a legitimate succession. Newton was not much of a legislator. There's only one speech on record um, from his nearly a year in Parliament, and that was a, uh, a request to a servant to close a window against a draft. <laughs> but he had a lot of fun in London. He met Locke for the first time. They became good friends. He met Samuel Pepys. Uh, he was entertained by the Earl of Halifax. Uh, he was presented at court. I mean, it was, it was heady. Cambridge, when he went back after Parliament, uh, finally did its business and, and ordered the coronation of William and Mary. Um, Cambridge was 5,000 people. Tiny place. It was not even then a particular... It, it was not then in one of its dynamic phases as an intellectual center. Uh, had a lot of time-serving careerists who would work as a professor until they got a good living uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a, a rural vicar someplace, and then they'd go off. Um, you know, the, the sort of tenor of the place was caught by an undergraduate. This is a apocryphal but possibly true story, who is said to have walked by Newton in 1690 or so and say, there goes the man that wrote a book that neither he nor anyone else understands. <laughs> London was where the action was. It was where the Royal Society was. It was where, you know, Sir Christopher Wren was. It was where people who actually understood what he was about, where Halley was. Um, and he wanted to get back. And it took him several years and the help of Locke and Montague later uh, later the Earl of Halifax and others to get him this position as the Warden of the Mint. But he'd been seeking it for five years. And what he'd been seeking specifically was a sinecure. He wanted a patronage job in the hands of these newly empowered Whigs who had supported William and Mary that would allow him to go to London, make a reasonable living, and not have to do very much, if anything at all, uh, except to be smart and brilliant and take part in the intellectual life of the capital. And this is exactly what he was promised. There are surviving letters that say, come to London, be warned in the mint, and surviving letters from the person, from the Chancellor of the Exchequer offering him the job. Come to London, be warned in the mint, you'll have no more work than you care to attend. And that's a very close paraphrase of the, of, of the critical sentence in that letter. Um, and I believe the Chancellor was, thought he was telling the truth, except there were two things wrong. One was that England was in a terrible uh, financial crisis caused by the... Uh, terrible debasement of English currency. Now, there are several reasons I go into them in the book, um, but essentially England's currency was then coin, and particularly silver coin. And the silver coin, as Newton measured it when he first arrived, was down to half its legal weight. Half of the entire money supply of the country had been stolen, disappeared. The reason for this was uh, silver currency was mispriced against gold in London compared to the price of gold measured in silver on the continent. So people would, every time they got a full weight legal coin, would melt it down, put it in a nice little ingot, ship it down the Thames across to Amsterdam or Paris or wherever, sell it, buy gold, come back, use that gold to buy silver, and just this lovely perpetual motion machine to get rich. Um, you know, when this was first investigated, the goldsmiths accused the Jews of doing this, of course. Um, and to, to his great credit, the Englishman 
the, 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 the member of parliament heading the investigative committee into this initial complaint in 1690 said, well, yes, the Jews do it, but lots of English Englishmen do it too. So acknowledge that the desire for easy and essentially untraceable ill-gotten wealth uh, extended beyond ethnic or religious uh, barriers. So there was no money. Um, there was also an extraordinary expense. This is something that, of course, would never happen today. Uh, England, from the start of William's reign, had engaged in a war with France that it could not pay for. Um, couldn't happen now, I know that. Uh, in the 16, uh, again, at the time Newton arrived in London, 1696, the cost of the war was consuming something like 80% of England's government revenues. It was a hugely expensive enterprise. And as the weight, as, as, as the value by weight of the English currency kept going down and down and down, the ability of the English to raise loans on the continent, to pay for the armies on the continent, was becoming much, you know, much more constrained. Um, and there was a real possibility in 1696-97 that England would lose the war by financial arrest. It simply wouldn't be able to keep their armies in the field. Uh, and that was what produced the pressure uh, to undertake uh, the, what's called the Great Recoinage, a complete replacement of England's silver currency. Take it all in, melt it down, um, say the old currency was no longer legal tender, remint it and distribute it again. This was underway just as Newton arrived. He had to take charge of it. He turned out to be brilliant at it. His training as an alchemist certainly helped. He did time and motion studies. He measured the capacity of the machines to do the jobs they were supposed to do. He ultimately came up with the required rhythm for the coining presses. It was like this one, two, about 55 times a minute, just slightly slower than the beating of an average human heart did it brilliantly, and he completed the, uh, the job faster than anyone had thought possible with accounts that were checked to the farthing. It was really a remarkable display of bureaucratic excellence. Not surprising given that it's Isaac Newton, but a little bit surprising given that he had no training at all for this kind of work. The other thing that went along with the job, and obviously this, this, you know, this doing this was not only as much work as you want. This was a full-time occupation for two years. He showed up in London expecting to be this brilliant person and instead he was a, you know, work like a dog inside the Tower of London where the mint was held. At the same time, in the same measurement that showed that the, the legal currency was had down to half its legal weight, Newton found that more than one in 10 coins was fake. Makes sense when you think about it. You need coin, you need money to try to have, do any business. You need money to pay your taxes. Uh, and if the government won't supply you with money, then free enterprise will. That's really, this was, if you'll forgive me, this was the golden age of English counterfeiting. And this was the market niche into which Challoner produced something like, he claimed, 30,000 pounds worth of false currency. To give you a sense of what that would be in modern, it's about between four and five million pounds in contemporary currency. It's a lot of money. Um, and Newton was, it turned out, the, the job of Warden carried with it the statutory responsibility uh, to be the pro to, to, to be the defender of the king's coins, he had to invest by rule. He had to investigate, uh, prosecute, and and see to the end any case of counterfeiting or coining that he could uh, that he could reach. He didn't want to do it. He tried to get out of the job, and the treasury told him, "No, you have to do it." And once he was compelled to do it, he did it with astonishing um, understanding and skill. He created a detective force really within just a very few months. He had agents. Some of them turned out to be very bad people. I mean, several of his agents ended up inside Newgate Jail instead of putting people inside there. Because, you know, if you're, you're all kind, if you have that kind of power and if you have that access to false coin and all this kind of stuff, there are all kinds of temptations in front of you. And lots of people fell into those temptations. Um, he bought disguises. There's a, 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 a line in his accounts that shows five pounds for a suit for one of his agents to go mix with a group of uh, a gang of counterfeiters. Uh, and again, for perspective, that had to have been some suit. Five pounds was a month's wages for a skilled artisan in London at that time. Um, you know, he was, uh, he understood, uh, he, he worked out how you solve problems of counterfeiting. Problem of counterfeiting is it's an organized crime and there's always that moment when some person has to do the retail act of placing a coin on somebody's counter saying, give me a pound of beef for that or whatever, right? And if you can catch the person passing the bad coin at the retail level, you can presume, you know, if you do it right, work your way back up the chain, the person who supplied them with the coin and so forth, until you get to the person you want. Newton understood this very, very rapidly, and he turned out to be very expert at it. That's why there are 400 records of these depositions and interrogations that he performed in the Tower of London. Um, and he was canny. 
I mean, people who, who first encountered him, criminals who first encountered him, thought he was this guy who didn't know what he was doing, and they made fun of him. They said bad things about him in jail. Unfortunately, they didn't know that Newton had figured out that one of the ways to get people to, to, to in front of the gallows or to pressure people to turn in those above them was to put in, you know, place informers at every turn. By the time Newton was done with Challoner, there was not one, not two, but three levels of informers in the cell with him. Challoner was very canny. He didn't speak to the first and obvious person who had a real overt reason to inform on him. He didn't speak to the second person because he saw that there were, I mean, I'm, I'm presuming here, but the second person was somebody who was friends with and in communication with the first one. He didn't speak to him. There was a third person whom Newton placed in the cell, who had no connection to the counterfeiting ring the challenger was involved in. He was a counterfeiter. He was very skilled one also. And there, challenger said, ah, I've got a peer. I can talk to him. He's going to admire what I've done. And there are these extraordinary long letters from this man back to Newton, reporting verbatim, you know, all the stuff that challenger is saying, who he's worried about, which witnesses he fears in his trial, all this sort of stuff. It's remarkable. Newton was a remarkably effective cop. He even had the ruthlessness to put the boot in when necessary. I found one letter, or one deposition, in which uh, it's actually a letter from a person he's about to interrogate named Thomas Carter, who was one of Challenger's close associates. And he wrote to Newton saying, I will testify. I'm ready. I'm pleased. You know, listen to me. And the last line in it is, I will have irons put on me tomorrow if your worship not order for the, to the contrary. Now, having irons put on you is it's wrist shackles or leg shackles or a neck. And those are just restraints, right? So there are restraints that can be adjusted to a certain size, and you can over-tighten them, and it's torture. Basically, this guy was saying, I will be physically harmed tomorrow unless you say otherwise, and believe me, I'll talk. You don't need to do this. Now, there's no record that Newton regularly sanctioned torture. Torture warrants had been a legal device used in England. They stopped in 1640. They weren't revived. Newton was willing to use all the tools of fear and, and intimidation that all policing types in London at that time did. There's no record that he was, uh, as one biographer wrote, of this bloodthirsty evil guy. But still, he used what he had before him. And the larger, you know, it's, it's, it's um, you know, there's, there's a small point here, which is, this is Isaac Newton. This is a guy who wrote Principia. This is a guy who, you know, put a bodkin underneath his eyeball to see what the effect of changing the shape of his eye would do to his vision. All this kind of stuff. How does he suddenly turn into this, this, you know, Kojak figure? I mean, it's sort of like imagining, you know, Ed Witten tracking down Bernie Madoff. It was just very, very difficult for me to get my head around that. But the larger point is you have a glimpse of Newton's mind in action. I mean, the same mind that solved the problems of motion and gravity turned to the, turned to this problem of solving counterfeiting, and he did it in the same way. He found the pattern. Um, he, he established the general principles that, that forgers had to use in order to get rich, and then he seized on the vulnerabilities within that sequence to identify how to, how to actually solve the question of who did what when. Um, I'm, I think I've used about just about all my time, so let me just give you one quick, um, one quick last uh, sort of episode from Newton's career as a, as a financial bureaucrat and at the same time as the great leader of this great scientific revolution. Again, to try and put these two persona into the one man that actually lived both those lives. Um, and, you know, it was very interesting. I mean, I, I was perplexed when I started the story. I, I wasn't sure how it would turn out. I mean, I knew that Newton chased the counterfeiter, got defeated by the counterfeiter a couple times, and then managed to build this extraordinary web of... of informers and, and, and criminal investigation that, that allowed him to just wrap Challoner up in an unbreakable chain uh, of evidence. He even went so far as to falsify some evidence, actually. I mean, there's the, the, the record of the trial itself is fascinating as an insight into the sort of, you know, um, tricks of late 17th century jurisprudence. And if there's questions about that, I'll go into more detail on that. Um, but what's really inter what, what, what really animated the whole three years I worked on this book for me was realizing that Newton's mind, and by extension the scientific revolution, of which it was a chief architect, encompassed you know, so much more than the sequence of mathematics and physics and the rest of natural science. The essential core of Newton's thought, as I came to try and see how all the different Newtons, Newton the theologian, Newton the alchemist, Newton the cop, Newton the physicist, were actually the same man, Newton's style of thought, central to it, was the idea of abstraction, of elucidating patterns from details of observation and experiment. And to use those patterns to explain and anticipate much, much more. 
move to abstraction can be seen in the way he organized his approach, his approach to particular crimes on the basis of the understanding of the architecture of criminal counterfeiting. It can be seen in a, here in a conception of money that he tried to advance that seemed really radical. This is a quote from him, and you know, I'm, I'm giving away who it's by. I usually said, who, who said this? It could be Ben Franklin. This is what he said. If interest be not yet low enough for the advantage of trade and the design of setting the poor on work, the only proper way to lower it is more paper credit till by trading in business, we can get more money. And this, tis mere opinion that sets a value upon metal money. We value it because we can purchase all sorts of commodities and the same opinion sets a like value upon paper money, paper security. That's Newton in 1702. You know, so, and what he's doing here is just as he does to, you know, all the observations of how cannonballs fly and apples fall and all this sort of stuff. You take them from all these individual observations coming up with a general pattern of motion, general understanding of motion. Here he's saying you can subject money to the same authority of number and calculation if you abstract it away from these chunks of metal and turn it into symbols, turn it into an idea. Newton approached all his experience in very similar ways. Not identical, but very similar ways. And that's where you can, I think, really start coming to grips with the power of the scientific revolution, not as the accumulation of a body of knowledge, but as an accumulation of, as a presentation of a really radically new way of organizing all of our understanding of the world around us. Again, this is a special audience. This is, I think, probably a commonplace. But what's striking is that Newton did it when it wasn't a commonplace and over a much wider range of objects than even most scientists today are still you know, focusing on and, and, and thinking as a scientist. So I'll, I'll go there with just one cautionary note. Newton's um, knowledge, Newton's ability to understand money, Newton's great mathematical skill were still not enough to save him from losing his shirt in a stock market bubble. Um, he invested in the South Seas bubble. I don't know. Again, I can explain more about that if, there, if there's any. It was basically an early debt for equity swap that turned into this enormous bubble for a variety of reasons. Newton actually had bought his stock very, very early, long before the bubble existed, sold it for a handsome profit in the spring of the six months of the, of the inflation of the bubble, um, then saw it triple by early summer, couldn't stand the so-called foregone profits, bought again at the top, it plateaued for a while, he bought more, and within about a month of the second purchase, it dropped off a cliff. And he later told his niece that he lost 20,000 pounds, or roughly 3 million pounds in contemporary money. And later said, in a warning for all of us irrationally exuberant types, that for all that he could work out the trajectory of a comet, quote, he could not calculate the madness of the people. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a lot, I, I've argued there's a lot to be taken out of that for contemporary circumstances. But I've talked long enough, and you've been most patient and kind, and you've laughed even at some of the jokes. So I think I should shut up now and, and open it to any questions. Thank you very much for your kind attention.